weren't able to join us, we can post it to the Big Read page of our website. So hold on, we get that set up. Alrighty. So thank you all so much for joining us today. My name is Stephanie Toole, and I'm the Education and Outreach Manager here at the Maslin Museum. I am also the Big Read Coordinator, and I'm sure all of you are either finished or currently working on reading through Circe by Madeline Miller, this year's book selection. We hope you're enjoying it. And thank you for joining us here for Dave Harding's Mythology 101 program. Um, if you want to check out more of our Big Read programming from the museum and our other community partners, including the Maslin Public Library and many others, you can go to maslinmuseum.org slash Big Read. The NEA Big Read is a program of the National Endowment for the Arts in partnership with Arts Midwest. Before we get started here today, we'll just go over a little bit of Zoom etiquette. So we are going to ask that everyone remain muted during the program, and we'll also ask that folks turn off your video while the PowerPoint is being shared, just so that we don't run into as many technical glitches, hopefully. On that end, Brandon Rohrer, our guest operations manager and resident tech guru, is on this call today. So if you do have any tech issues, please message those in the chat feature, and we can um, limit Nancy here, and then we'll get those sorted for you. If you have any questions, feel free to message those in the chat as well. You can send them either directly to me or you can send them to everyone in the chat. If it's anything very pressing, Dave has okay that I unmute and that I ask him the question then and there, but otherwise we'll save questions for the end. Um, and then without further ado, I'll introduce our wonderful speaker. So Dave Harding has degrees in English and in theater. He taught for 42 years at Washington High School and 12 years for Stark State College. He is a two-time Stark County Teacher of the Year who now serves on four boards, including the Maslin Museum and Maslin Parks and Recreation. He's married to Sue, has two children, Jessica and Jared, and two grandchildren, Emmett and Isla. So I'll turn it over to you, Dave. Well, thank you, Stephanie, I appreciate that. Thank you all for coming on this morning. I hope that this turns out to be both interesting and informative. To listen to me for a while could become very boring. So feel free to throw any questions in you want to, and we'll try to keep this as lively and moving as we possibly can. Okay, let's get started. The biggest question, of course, is what is mythology? Mythology is a system of normally religious beliefs that a country or an, a, a group of people have that no longer really exist. Nobody in the world right now has a belief in what we call Greek mythology or Roman mythology or Norse mythology. Those gods are gone. They served their purpose and their purpose normally was to try to explain how in the world the world works. They had the answers for everything, especially the Greeks and the Romans. The Romans were not that creative. They were great in warfare, they were great in conquering lands, but they were not a creative people. The Greeks, however, were. And when the Greeks had a system of questions, they came up with a god or an entity that would serve their purposes. For example, if you'd walk down the street and you see a tree, you didn't just see a tree, they were actually inside each of the trees spirits that made the tree grow and made the leaves come out and made the leaves fall. That was controlled by the entity inside the tree. And it, it went on like this for everything in the world they could possibly try to imagine. And sometimes in the cosmos and beneath the earth also. So that's how mythology really is. But today we're going to take a look at primarily 99% Greek mythology because that's what's involved with Circe. Um, and let's get started with slide number one, if you would, and we'll go from there. What you're looking at now is a picture of Cronus. And here's how it all began. In the very beginning, according to the Greeks, there was nothing that existed except chaos, literally chaos. Out of chaos came two beings, if you would. One called Uranus, that was the sky, and one called Gaia, G-A-E-A, -A, and that was what we call Mother Earth. Since there was nothing else to do, the two of them got together and they touched. 
the sky touching the earth, and they produced offspring. They produced three different sets of offspring. One we know as the Titans. Those were the major uh, six entities that controlled and started everything to do with Greek mythology. They also created the Cyclops. Those were deformed Titans, ones that didn't quite turn out the way that everybody wanted to. They were literally banished later on beneath the earth. And he also created the Furies. And if you remember, in, if you've read Circe, at the very beginning of the book, the Furies become very, very important uh, when they deal with Prometheus and things of that nature. Those three groups, if you would, are the ones that ruled the entire cosmos. Unfortunately, one of them, that's Cronus, the one you're looking at, was told by his father that one day one of his children would overthrow him. Where would he get a wife from? Well, obviously from one of his sisters. That's the only people that were around, if you would. So he came up with a very ingenious plan. Every time his wife had a child, he would eat the child, literally eat the child. He did this five times. Each of the first five children that were out, he consumed. Nobody's going to overthrow him then. His wife got tired of this and said, wait a minute, this is stupid. I'm producing children and my husband's eating them. She came up with a plan. When the sixth child came out, she wrapped him up and hid him away. Inside the swaddling clothes that all the Titans were clothed in, she put a huge boulder. She offered it to her husband. He consumed it. He was happy. Unfortunately, when you consumed a boulder, you upchucked it eventually. He upchucked this rock, and that first upchuck, and it was the way that all five of the Titans that had been swallowed came out into the world. The sixth one, the one who was saved, was Zeus. He was the important one because he's the one that's going to become the leader of all of them. The Titans got together, the six of them, they overthrew Cronus, and they decided to rule the cosmos. This was a 10-year war, but finally the dad was defeated, and the six Titans ruled everything. And on the next slide, you're going to see Zeus. Zeus is considered to be the leader of all of the uh, Titans. He's the leader of the gods and things of that nature. In Roman mythology, he's called Jupiter or Jove. You've heard the phrase by Jove. And there's a planet name for that, obviously. He's the chief god of the sky. And he's pictured with normally the same two emblems, the eagle, which you can see sketched off to the side there, and also the thunderbolt, which was his weapon. And that was what mortals were feared, or mortals feared the very most. He ruled Olympus, which is where the gods lived. That was an entity right above the earth, not a heaven, if you would, but it was literally a land up there where the gods lived. Demigods lived right below that, and then the human beings lived uh, on the earth below that. The gods ate an entity called ambrosia. They drank nectar, which is a type of a wine. Now, you would think that if you're the king of the gods, you're going to be an example for your people. You're going to have the human beings that worshipped you just say, gee, what a swell guy this is. But that was not Zeus. Zeus did get married. He married his sister Hera. There weren't a whole lot of other choices around. But he loved to dally with earth people. He loved to dally with other gods and goddesses, if you will. Let me tell you three real quick stories. He dallied with an earth girl named Io, spelled I-O. And when he dallied with her, he got her pregnant. This was not good because Hera found out about it. And Hera, his wife, was a very jealous goddess. She decided, I'm going to find her and destroy her. I don't want offspring coming to an earth girl. Zeus panicked, figured, huh, where can I possibly hide her? 
He came on the plan. He transformed her into a cow and he put her in with a herd of other cows. Ah, he said, she's safe. She can have my child, I can live calf, and things are going to be just well. Well, Hera found out about the plan and decided to send a pestilence, if you would, to destroy all the cows. Zeus rescued Io, took her to an island. She delivered his offspring, and that's another whole story. He also had a dalliance with a, a, a minor goddess named Semele, S-E-M-E-L-E. Now, Semele was one that he thought was absolutely gorgeous. And he said to her, hey, will you have my child? She said, yes, of course. Hera found out about it. She always did. She came to, to Semele and said, look, I know what you're doing. You're having an affair with my husband. You can continue having the affair, excuse me, <coughs> but here's the plan. I want you to ask my husband for a favor. If he agrees, he's got to go through with it. So he did go through with a favor. This is what she asked for. She wanted to see him as a god. She wanted to see him in all of his glory. Human beings could not do that because they were just not capable of seeing all the things that a god a goddess would look like. But he had promised, so he did. He revealed the smallest amount of himself as he could to her. Immediately, she caught on fire. Hera was thrilled. She was going to be burned up, and she was burned up. However, Zeus was able to rescue the unborn baby. He took it and attached it to his left leg, literally. Time passes. The child is born from there. And that was the child called Dionysus, who we'll talk about later on, who became one of the 12 important gods. So he delivered his own child without any help from uh, his wife or anything of that nature. And a final story, just to give you an example, was the uh, a nymph called Leto, L-E-T-O. He had an affair with her. He got her pregnant. He hid her on an island. Hera found out about it. And if you remember in the book Circe, there was a goddess whose major job was to help women through childbirth. Hera forbade her to come and help her out. So she had to give birth to the children. And it was an extremely painful decision, a painful way for a god, to, I'm sorry, a goddess to do this type of thing. Who were the children? Apollo and Artemis, two other very important ones. So as you can see, <coughs> excuse me, as you can see, Zeus was nobody to mess around with. He loved his dalliances, and he and his wife had many, many different times where they would go at each other and uh, fight over what was going to be happening and how much power Zeus really had. Let's take a look at his wife. <coughs> this is Hera. Hera was the queen of the gods, and she's also, of course, the sister of Zeus. She's known for being the goddess of marriage and of birth. She's very, very vengeful toward her husband because of the many affairs that he had. We've talked enough about her. Let's move on to another one of the gods. This is Poseidon. Now, most of you will recognize Poseidon because of his weapon, and that, of course, is the trident. He's known for carrying it around. He's known for uh, the different things he could do. He was the god of the sea. He was in charge of earthquakes and storms, and he created horses. And you may say, well, how's that important? Well, here's why it's important. His job was to take horses and make them something that could live underwater. That's how we got seahorses. He also was in charge of creating people and forming them into different styles and different images. And if you remember in Circe, one of the things was that no mortal looked like another mortal. They were all different from each other. And that was because of the work that uh, Poseidon did. Poseidon was also called Neptune. We know that phrase. He's the son of Cronus and Rhea. He was one of the ones that were swallowed. And he and his other two brothers 
cast lots after defeating their dad to see who would rule where. Zeus got the heavens, Poseidon got the seas, and another brother, Hades, got the underworld. We'll talk about him in a minute. Moving on to Hephaestus. Now, Hephaestus was also known as Vulcan. He was the one who was in charge of the metalworking, of the stone masonry, the forges, the different uh, sculptures that were created. And as you can possibly see here, he doesn't look just as good as some of the other ones did. Here's why. When he was born, he offended in one way or another Hera. Hera was told by Zeus, hey, ignore it. He's a, a, a minor god. Don't worry about it. Hera said, no, 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 no. I'm going to punish him. She took and threw him from Olympus down to the earth, and he hit the earth. Now, he could not be killed because he was a god, of course, but he could be injured, and he was. He was terribly maimed. His legs were crushed, and you, you may or may not be able to tell this, but he's standing on something to support himself, and he's never able to actually stand up straight. Zeus was livid at his wife for doing this. She, he said, look, maybe he looks ugly, maybe he's deformed, but he can have a most beautiful wife. So he was married to the most beautiful of all the goddesses, and that was Aphrodite. Excuse me just one minute. And Dave, we do have a question in the chat here. Excellent. Someone, someone asks, are Apollo and Circe's father the same god? Say that again. Are Apollo and Circe's father the same god? No. Helios was a, a more minor god than what Apollo was. Apollo was one of the big 12. Helios was a one step lower uh, god. He had all kinds of power. Now, both of them had the power of the, the sh what they called the shining, where if you looked at them, they glowed and things of that nature. We're going to show a picture a little bit later of what Helios looked like. And he's normally just pictured as the sun, where Apollo is pictured as being in the battlefields, having much more encounter with the earth people than what Helios did. So I hope that answers the question. Thank you so much for asking. It saves me from having to keep talking like this. Moving along to Hermes. The Hermes, also known as Mercury, is the messenger of the gods, and he plays a huge role, if you'll remember, in the novel Circe. Huge role. And he's considered a protector of travelers, and he's the god of fertility, wealth, luck, sleep, thieves, and all types of different languages. You'll notice on his right hand, he's carrying his major symbol, and that was the caduceus. And that's a staff with the two intertwined snakes. You'll see that sometimes with doctor's offices today. Moving to Athena. Now, Athena is also known as, known as Minerva. And her birth was extraordinarily different. Zeus started to get headaches. Why? I don't know. He did. He didn't know what to do. So he said to his wife, look, please take an axe, hit me in the head. I've got to cure these headaches. She was more than happy to hit him in the head with an axe. She did so and outsprang Athena. All right. Athena was fully clothed, had all the weaponry you see with her. And that is the only god that was the goddess that was born from the head of Zeus. She's the goddess of wisdom because she came from the mind of Zeus. And she's called sometimes Pallas. You've heard the phrase Pallas Athena. She's associated with wisdom and handcrafts and warfare. And her symbols obviously were the owl and the olive tree and the snakes. And you can see that as you can see. Medusa there on her shield. We're going to move now to the next of the slides, and that will be Ares. Ares is the god of war. 
He's called Mars in the Roman mythology. He's probably the most unpopular of all the gods because of his quick temper, his aggressiveness, and his unquenchable thirst for conflict. He seduced Aphrodite, which was a no-no, except if he was Zeus, had almost a child with her, and then fought later on with Hercules, and literally was defeated by Hercules. He had two children, male children. One was called Phobos, that translates into fear, and the other one was called Deimos, D-E-I-M-O-S, and that was terror. He had one daughter, and she was known as Enyo, E-N-Y-O, and that's discord. He would love to take those three children with him in his chariot. And you can imagine the god of war with discord and pain and terror riding along with him. And so you get the whole image here of how it works. He fought against other gods. He fought against mortals. He was able to be wounded because one of the mortals, Diomedes, actually wounded him so badly he almost didn't get healed. Couldn't be killed, but almost couldn't be healed. We're going to move to Aphrodite. This is the Aphrodite is the uh, is Venus. We know that you can see to her uh, all over her shoulder is Cupid. Uh, she's known as the goddess of love and beauty, pleasure, passion, and procreation. She uh, was married to Hephaestus. We told you that because she's the most beautiful. He was considered to be the uh, most unbeautiful of all of them. Her different symbols include roses and doves, sparrows and swans. And it's time now to take a look at a very unusual god. And this is Hades. He's the third of the brothers. If you remember, Zeus got the heavens and Poseidon got the seas. He got the underworld. In his whole realm, he became so popular there that the realm itself was named for him. And if you remember in, in Circe, he plays a major role because once you get into his land, you cannot get out of his land. There are exceptions. If you read a whole lot of Greek mythology, you'll see that there were people that got out uh, for different reasons, uh, sometimes because they're heroes or whatever. Let's talk about the underworld for just a second. I don't know what your system of beliefs is, nor is it important, but some people believe that there's what they call a heaven and a hell and maybe a purgatory in between. Hell has a very negative image fire and brimstone and suffering and pain. Their underworld was different. They did not have that type of physical pain. What they had was the idea that there was no place else to go. You were just there. You knew each other. You could meet with each other and spend time with each other, but you were not going anywhere else. You were never going to get out of there. You were never going to go, quote, up. There was no immediate in-between place, and he ruled that land very, very strictly. In fact, in order to make sure that nobody got out, he had a three-headed dog named Cerberus that guarded the entrance to his world. When you died, you went through a whole different bunch of stages of things that would happen to you, and you had to go across five different rivers to get to his world. We're going to talk about a character called Karen, C-H-A-R-O-N in a couple minutes, but he was the gentleman who rode you across these rivers to get you to the underworld. In order to do that, you had to have money to pay Karen. You had to have a coin. That coin was put on your tongue when you died. So if you ever beheaded and he couldn't find your head, you could never get to the underworld and your spirit was just condemned to wander meaninglessly throughout the entire universe forever. Another more 
unknown of the major gods is the next slide, and that's Demeter. Demeter is also known as Cirrus. We get the word Cereal from her name. She's the goddess of the harvest and presides over all the grains and all the fertility of the earth. And she's referred to as the goddess of the harvest. She's also uh, in charge of law. Now, she had a daughter named Persephone, and Persephone was a very beautiful, very um, sought-after goddess, if you will. Hades saw her one day. He left his realm, grabbed her in his chariot, and took her under the world to be with him. Oh, did Demeter get angry? This was not going to happen. She, she implored Zeus to get the girl back. Zeus didn't want to offend the brother. He said, okay, fine, here's how it's going to work. You have to give the girl back. And Persephone was going to be sent back to the earth as long as she had eaten absolutely nothing in the underworld. Some of you may know the story. While she was down there, she ate six tiny little pomegranate seeds. Well, said Zeus, we have a problem now. She ate something. It wasn't a whole lot of anything. But now she cannot just simply come back. So what the deal was that they worked out was this. For six months of the year, she'd go home to her mother. And while she was here, the mother was ecstatic. And things grew on the earth. And it became beautiful and lovely spring and summer. After six months, she had to go back to Hades. And that was when we had winter and fall and things got dead and not so much live uh, growing things. We only have a couple more of these major gods to look at. So let's move on to Apollo. Now Apollo, as you can see, is sometimes called Phoebus, which is a sun. He's the god of the sun, of light, of music, and of poetry. He's considered to be the most beautiful of all the male gods. He was the epitome of them. And let's talk about this for just a second. If you're a religious person, in your mind, if I said, what does God look like? You have an image. No matter what religion in the world you have, whoever your belief system says is God, you have an image in your mind of what that entity would look like. The Greeks, when they did theirs, they had to do the same thing, but they had no idea what gods would look like. So what they did, and you've seen this through all the slides, these are absolutely beautiful entities. I know I use the word entities a lot, but I do. These beings were like perfect human beings. They were all gorgeous to look at, very muscular, very fit, and something that you could idolize. That theory of making a god look like a man has a big fancy name called anthropomorphism. And we do the same thing. If, I, if somebody said to me, picture God, in my mind, I have an image. And in your mind, if you believe in a god, then you have an image. And they had images of all of their gods. But you can see these people look really, really good. He's in charge of harmony and moderation, moral virtue, and his best friends were the muses. We'll talk about them in just a, uh, a few minutes. Artemis is also, his next slide, she's the goddess of hunting. She protects all the animals, and you did not want to mess with her. She is a major part in the novel Circe also, She's the patron saint, uh, patron saint, the patron of girls and young women, and one of the protectresses during childbirth. One of the stories connected with her is that one day a hunter went out and killed a deer. This angered her to such a degree, she found him, changed him into a deer, and sent a whole group of wild bears after, and he destroyed. So these people sometimes not to be messed with, 
He especially didn't want to get into their realms. And finally, of the major gods is Dionysus. You can see the wine. You can see the grapes. You can see his uh, visage, uh, very grizzled, looks a little bit hungover. He's also known as Bacchus. You may have sometime in your life heard of the term Bacchanalian, which means a major party with a lot of wine and revelry of things of that nature. He's in charge of fertility, theater, religious ecstasy, and things that were above and beyond uh, what most of the people uh, considered to be important. He was the relief, if you would. So those are your 12 major ones. Most of these, if not all, lived on Olympus, except for the two, Poseidon who lived in the sea, and Hades who lived in the underworld. So beyond that, uh, they all lived on Olympus, as we mentioned earlier. Let's take a few minutes and move on to something a little bit different. Let's take a look at some of the other minor deities. All right. You're looking at a picture of uh, one of the minor people, <coughs> excuse me, called Arachne. Now, Arachne was an earth girl. And she was one of the most talented of all the weavers on the earth. Time after time, there would be contests. Time after time, she would win. And people oohed and on over what she was able to produce. She got a little bit too vain and said that she was even more talented than Athena was. Now, Athena was not happy about this. Athena was known as a great weaver. So Athena came down to the earth and she challenged Arachne to a weaving contest. The two began. Both produced beautiful things. But where Athena was able to produce things that had gold and glisten, Arachne could not do that. Her thing was judged beautiful, but she did not win. Athena did. And like we've said before, you don't mess around with these people. Athena transformed Arachne into a spider. And that's where we get the class of arachnids, which is where spiders came from. Yes, they spin beautiful webs, but that's all they can do. And they don't last long. And that's an example of what the Greeks thought and how we got spiders on the earth. The next one we're going to take a look at is Pandora. Now, most of you have heard of Pandora, but here's her story. She was considered to be the very first, very first, the very first human being ever created. She was created by Hephaestus, and Zeus said, look, take her and make her to be somebody that will be worshipped and idolized by people on earth. She went to a wedding. And when she went to the wedding, she was given a box, which you can see pictured here. She was told, look, do not open that box under any condition. You can do anything you want to, but do not open that box. She opened the box. And all the miseries, all the lousy things that inhabit the earth today, sadness and death and pain, escaped from that box. So they blamed her for it. She looked into the box and in the very, very bottom in a little corner, there was one tiny, tiny thing left. And that was hope. And so today we have hope that even no matter what's going on, be it a pandemic, be it whatever, there's always going to be a possibility that things will get better. All right, let's take a second here and do something else. Notice that they have... Uh, a box that gives out nastiness to the world. If you read a book called the Bible, in the Bible, there's a snake that brings an apple down. Eva said, look, don't touch that tree. Don't do it. She did. And look at all the things that happened. So you can see the parallels. Most mythology that parallels to each other. For example, in the Bible, it talks about a flood of 40 days and 40 nights. 
The Greeks had a flood story also. Theirs lasted nine days. So other mythologies, depending on where you were at, they all had flood stories. They all had stories about how pain got in the world. They all paralleled each other, but they all had their own separate uh, interpretations. Let's go to the next slide. And this is Hercules. Hercules, also known as Heracles, was a son of Zeus and a mortal called Alchemy, A-L-C-E-M-E. Alchemy was a very famous woman in the fact that her son, being fathered by Zeus, was promised all kinds of good things. As a child, Hercules was strong. In fact, when he was just an infant, two serpents got into the house, two snakes. The mother found out about it, was terrified, ran into the nursery. And Hercules had taken care of the problem. He had taken both of the snakes, squeezed the life out of them, and was holding them in his hand at a very early baby age. His life wasn't easy because he had offended a few of the gods and goddesses. He had to perform... 12 tasks. Many of you are familiar with them. Uh, getting the, the, the lion and getting the fleeces and things of that nature. But as a reward for his suffering after he did them, he was promised he would be a demigod. Now, a demigod was human mother and a god for a father. And he lived right below Mount Olympus. So he's revered by them and we all know the name of Hercules even today. Moving along to the centaurs. Now, centaurs were a very interesting creature. They had the uh, half man and half horse. And they were ruled over by Dionysus, the god of wine. Now, as you know, if you drink too much wine or follow Dionysus too closely, you're going to do some very strange bizarre, possibly dangerous things. And that's what these represented. They were some of the urgings the human beings had and the ways that they escaped using the wine or whatever else they did. They were known for being very savage, being very rowdy, and of course, very boisterous. Medusa is a name that most of us know. That'd be the next slide. Yeah, there she is. All right. Now, Medusa was one of the three Gorgon sisters. Excuse me just a sec. And the Gorgon sisters were, at the very beginning, extremely beautiful women. All of them were uh, ones that were idolized by people and things of that nature. Medusa made one mistake. She had an affair with a sea god, Poseidon. Athena got very angry about that. And since she was the only one that had done this, she was the one that was punished. She was made into a greenish-hued entity. And as we all know, her hair was turned into snakes. You can easily see that there. If you looked at her, as you know from probably your own background. If you looked at it, you turned into stone. As the story goes on, Perseus was able to kill her by holding up his shield. The reflection from her gaze was into the shield. By following a picture, he was able to get there and cut off her head. The droplets of blood dropped to the earth, and from one of them sprang Pegasus, the winged horse. All of these things are intertwined with each other, but Medusa's name has been around forever and ever. Moving to a character we talked about a little earlier, we now have Karen. And there's a picture of him rowing souls across the river Styx. Styx was one of the major rivers of the underworld. As you mentioned earlier, there were five of them. And you can see in the hand of the one Right in the middle, the, the younger, the, the lady, she's holding up something that looks to be a coin to offer him as a bribe. Each of the different rivers had a different property. There was Lathe, the river of forgetfulness, 
You forgot that you were human. You didn't want to go back. There was Styx, the river of the dead. And each of the five rivers had their own powers. And his job was to get you across all of them and get you to the land of Hades, the underworld where you would stay forever and ever, period. Moving to a little bit more pleasant topic, we have the muses. Now the muses, there were nine of them all together, were the goddesses of literature, science, and the arts. For example, Calliope was the muse of epic poetry. Clio, C-L-I-O, was the muse of history, and Arato was the muse of love poetry, and each of the different ones was in charge of some form of literature, science, or the arts. Pan is a very important creature. Now, Pan, had, Pan was a god of the wild. He was in charge of shepherds and flocks. And he has the hindquarters, legs, and horns of a goat. You can see that there in the same manner as a fawn or a satyr did. He loved to seduce earth girls and things of that nature. Now, let's take a moment. We have seven days in a week. Those seven days of the week have names to them. For example, there's Friday, which is from Norse. And there's Sunday, which literally means the day of the sun, because it begins the week. We have Monday, which is moon day, which is the day that we don't want to see normally. It was a very dark, considered day. And Tuesday and Wednesday was Woden's Day. Thursday was Thor's Day. Friday was Friday, F-R-E-Y. Those all came from the Norse. But Saturday was interesting, because Saturday was named from the Greeks. Satyrs, the day of the, the, the creatures that followed or looked like Pan, who partied and seduced. And Saturday is the day where most parties take place, if you will. So that's an important consideration as we try to further explain how the world works and how we got the names of the days of the week. Moving also along, we have the fates. Now, there were three of them, and this to the Greeks was an extremely important consideration. There were three of them. They're also called the Morai, M-O-I-R-A-I. And the three of them were each given a different job. There's Clotho, C-L-O-T-H-O, whose job was to spin the thread of life. Each person had their own thread of life. They saw it in the palm of your hand. And people would say, oh, that's your lifeline in your hand. And if you've gone to some of the people who, quote, read palms, they look at that and say, you're going to live a long life or whatever. Well, the Greeks believed that Clotho was the one that spun that. Lachesis was the one who stretched it out for a certain length. And that was the length of your life. And finally, Atropo, A-T-R-O-P-O-S, was the one who cut it. So your life was determined by these three entities called the fates. And that's how your, quote, fate was determined. Also, a, a different group of people, if you will, were the Furies. Now, you saw them playing a prominent role in the uh, novel Circe. They're also called the Erinyes, E-R-I-N-Y-E-S. There's only three of them, and they were charged with retribution, who punished for crimes. And if you remember, they were created at the very, very beginning of the universe. So they've been around forever and ever. They were really concerned about homicides and offenses against the gods and perjury. And if you remember what they did to Prometheus in the novel, they were nobody to mess around with. And finally, Cerberus. A three-headed dog that we mentioned earlier, which is the next slide. All right. He was killed by Hercules. The only way you could kill him was to pick him up and hold him so his paws did not touch the earth. And only Hercules was able to do that. So he guarded to make sure nobody could out. Hercules wanted to have somebody 
out. He killed the dog. And that's how the story goes from there. Okay, we've given you a whole lot of information in the time that we've spoken so far. So we've got some more information to share with you. So you, with your indulgence, let's keep going on. All right. These are some of the figures from the Trojan War. Why do we include them? All right. The biggest event in the entire Greek world was the Trojan War. Was there really a Troy? Yes, there was. It's over in what we call Turkey today. It actually did exist. And was there a huge war? Yes, there was. And the people that were involved with this were the heroes, the, the ones that the human beings could relate to because they were human. So where you could not relate to the gods, you could relate to these people who fought this huge 10-year war. The gods themselves could not leave the mortals alone. alone. If you notice in Circe, the gods kept coming to visit Circe. The goddesses would come and visit. And they all play important roles in that particular book. In the Trojan War, not only did they do that, they divided up sides. Some of them supported the Greeks. Some supported the Trojans. And they would fight with each other. They'd play tricks. They would protect certain mortals. They would do all types of different things. This particular war, the Trojan War, was so important to the Greeks that there are books written about it. There's the Iliad, written by Homer. There's the Odyssey. There's the Aeneid, written by Virgil. So the Romans did their own book. These books are ones that maybe you've read. I'm sure you've heard of them. But they were the most important things because it showed that human beings had powers and could deal with the gods. And it was a way to explain our interactions with them. So let's take a look at some of them. This is Helen, Helen of Troy. All right. She was considered to be uh, the face that launched a thousand ships. And time permitting, we'll tell you a little bit more about her. But she's the one that the war was fought over. She was married to Menelaus, who was the king of Sparta. And she has some stories connected with her that we may get to later on, depending on our time frame. Let's go to the next slide, start looking at some of the warriors in the war. This is Agamemnon. <coughs> he was the leader of all the Greek forces. He was uh, very important in the Iliad, if you've ever read the Iliad. He's a great warrior, but a very, very selfish individual. He wanted what he wanted. He didn't really care what his troops wanted. He wanted to win, but he wanted to win his own way. He prolonged the war by a couple of things that he did during the war. And uh, he prolonged the suffering of his men at the same time. Let's take a look at another. This is Achilles. Now Achilles was the hero of the Trojan War. He's considered to be the greatest of all the Greek warriors. And he's a central character of the Iliad, if you've read that book, or maybe intend to read that book sometime. Let's do two real quick stories, if you will. Agamemnon. When Agamemnon was uh, asked to go to war. Agamemnon did not want to go. He didn't want to have anything to do with the war. And he was under extreme pressure to lead the troops. Achilles also did not want to go. His mother was Thetis, who's one of the sea nymphs. She didn't want her son to go to war. She was afraid he might die because he was mortal. So she tried to protect him. She dipped him, if you remember your, some of your stories in the past, into the river. Unfortunately, where she held him on his heel was the only vulnerable spot on his body. And that plays a major role later on. In order to be sure that he did not have to go to war, she took him and hid him among a group of women. 
Now you can picture, here's a guy, probably six foot four, 240 pounds, looking like this, sitting among a group of women who are sewing, working and weaving, working on their looms or whatever. The Greek troops came, couldn't find him, looked at the women, thought, huh, what are we going to do? We can't find him. He said, wait a minute, I'm tired of being in the loom with the looms. And he decided to fight in the war, which is a good thing to do, except it had tragic consequences at the end. Moving to the next character, Hector. Now, Hector represents the Trojan side. He was their greatest warrior during this thing. He was the leader of all the Troy. He supposedly killed over 31,000 of the Greek warriors. He was killed by Achilles during the war. Menelaus was a figure in the Trojan War. He led the Spartan contingency. He's the, Hel he's the husband of Helen of Troy and was the one who wanted to get the war started to try to get his wife back when, he was, when she was stolen from him. Priam and Hecuba, now that's the king and queen of Troy. During the war, they ruled as well as they could. Uh, during the whole lifespan they spent together, Helen, uh, Helen, Hecuba had 19 different children. Uh, some of them were Hector and Paris and Cassandra. We'll talk about Cassandra in just a minute. During the war, also, Priam, who ruled with an iron fist, was able to hold off the Greeks for 10 years. During his lifetime, he supposedly fathered 18 daughters and 68 sons, not all through uh, the same woman, Hecuba, but through different concubines that he had. Moving to another very important character of the Trojan War was Patroclus. Now, Patroclus is an interesting character. He was the best friend of Achilles. Some people said he was the lover of Achilles. Some people said just best friend. It doesn't really make a whole lot of difference in the story. He killed a lot of Trojans during the war. In fact, he was so enamored of Achilles, he did a very bold act, which did cost him his life. Thetis, who we mentioned earlier, is pictured there on the right. She's a goddess of the sea, and she led the Nereids, and she was a shape changer. She could transform herself into different shapes as it went on. And she was, as we mentioned earlier, the mother of Achilles. Ajax the Lesser was a leader of the Lucrian branch of the Greek soldiers. And when they were sailing away from uh, Troy toward the end of the war, before their big plot, he was the one who led the sailors on the ships and things like that. Because of that, he got a very vain head, decided he was equal to the gods and boasted how much he could do. And he was then brought back to the war and things happened that he wound up having to kill himself. I'm not sure of our time frame, and so we'll see how much of the Trojan War story we can actually tell you. We have Cassandra. Now, there is no picture of Cassandra present today. Cassandra was an interesting character from this point of view. She was the Trojan priestess. We mentioned her earlier. She was cursed. Her curse was this. She always told the truth. Every prophecy she made came true, but nobody ever believed her because of things that she had done earlier and offended the gods. So she told the truth, nobody believed her, and that turned out to be a tumultuous event during the war. This character you're looking at right now is Diomedes. Diomedes is the favorite warrior of Athena. 
and he actually got to drive her chariot once. He was the only hero that uh, wounded an Olympian god. That was Ares. We mentioned that earlier. Also, we have Aeneas. This picture portrays a lot of what we have Aeneas says. He was a Trojan hero. He was the son of Anchises and of Aphrodite. And he's famous for leading the Trojans as long as he could. But when the city, which you can see pictured behind him, was going to fall, he carried his lame dad, Anchises, from the city. His son, Ascanius, clung to him to be saved. And his wife, Creusa, C-R-E-U-S-A, followed. So he was able to save them. And then his story is famously told in the Aeneid, which is the Trojan version of what happened during the war. And finally here, we have the Trojan horse. And many of you know what this is. You know, a Trojan horse simply means a, a deceitful thing. After the 10-year war, the Trojan, horror was, the Trojan horse was one of the turning points of the war. It was thought of by uh, Odysseus. And the plot involved getting this horse into the city. And then what happened afterwards? We have two more pictures here to show you that connect with this. The next one is Astanax. And this is a very sad story from this point of view. The war was over and the Greeks won. The Trojans were defeated very, very mightily. And as the Greeks were known to do, they slaughtered everybody they could possibly find. They killed all the women, they killed all the children. Here you're seeing the son of Hector. That's the little baby being held over the parapet there. His name was Astanax, A-S-T-Y-A-N-A-X. In order to kill him, they dropped him over the wall. He was the very last character to die in the Trojan War. You might ask, wait a minute, who was the very first one to die in the Trojan War? 10 years earlier, his name, which we're not going to show you a picture of, was Protestalos, Protest, I-L-A-U-S. And the legend has it that the word was out, whoever went on the, the land first of Troy was going to be the first to die. Protestalos volunteered. He put a foot on the land, an arrow killed him, and his soul went to the underworld. His wife lamented his passing, and because of what bravery he had done, he was unable to come back for a time, be with her, and then the two of them were taken together to the underworld at a later time period. And finally, we mentioned Troy itself, and this is what Troy looked like. And you could see where it was a heavily fortified area, and to try to get into the city was a very, very daunting task. You can see that. Uh, it was well thought out, easily defendable, and different aspects of the war took place in it. Now, even though this is a rendering of it, if you go to the very next slide, this rock was found in that area right there in Troy. I do not read Greek, but it does mention Troy on this. It talks about the war itself. So this was found... Uh, uh, near the mouth of the Dardanelles and is revered today as being a very important part of the history. Let's move on for a little bit longer here. We're going to talk about uh, some of the characters in Circe. Now Circe, as you've read the book, and you know is a minor goddess in Greek mythology. She was the daughter of Helios and of the nymph Perse. She was renowned, of course, for her knowledge of potions. She was banished to the island of Aia because of things that she had done. And uh, she honed her craft there. And I don't want to ruin the book for you. That's another talk for a different day. Also in that book is Helios. That's the sun. That's the sun. And there's the way he's normally pictured. He rides a golden chariot. 
And if you remember uh, in the book, he is a very, very vengeful, very powerful entity who rules with an iron fist. At night, he do the return uh, voyage, and you can see his uh, chariot going over the horizon as the cold sun set. Uh, Helios uh, has a son. Uh, as you remember, had two sons, two daughters. Uh, in one version of the mythology, he took his son and who had died and made him into a constellation. Another character from there was Selene. This is the goddess of the moon. She's the daughter of two of the Titans. She was a sister of Helios and of Eos, Eos, who was the goddess of the dawn. So between the three of them, we had the sun, the moon, and the dawn, and she had her own role. She fell in love uh, with a human being called Endymion and bore him 50 daughters during time period. Goes on. During the daytime, she'd raise the children, but then she'd do her job right at the beginning of the time period where Dawn came out and um, go from there. Charybdis was played a prominent part in uh, Circe. Charybdis was a very unique monster. It dwelt in the Strait of Messina. It was rationalized to be a whirlpool entity. Uh, it lived under a rock on one side of the street. As you remember from the book, opposite Charybdis was another monster called Scylla, who lived inside a rocky area. And this is the danger that the sailors had, is if one side didn't get you, then the other side would. Next, we have Odysseus. Odysseus was a huge character in Circe for a lot of different reasons. He was king of Ithaca and the main protagonist in the Odyssey, a great warrior. He survived. He is so well known. There was a whole book called The Odyssey written about him and his exploits on the way home from the war because the war lasted 10 years. It took him another 10 years to get back home because he had offended the gods with something he had done during the Trojan War. Uh, an interesting fact from history, when Odysseus came back home, they give an exact date that he arrived. And that was October 25th of the year 1207 BC. October 25th, 1207 BC. Why is that important? The exact date's not important. But what the Greeks were trying to do is what they call verisimilitude. And that is to give you information, like an exact date, that makes you in your mind go, wait a minute, this could possibly be true. This really happened. There really was a guy named Odysseus. But there really was a war. And that's what the Greeks would do. They would give you just enough of something to make you believe so that as the stories went down through the ages, you could say, yeah, but he came home on October 25th. So people go, that's the exact date. It must have been true. Um, we know how he died because of the book. And we also know, that I'm sure you picture later on, of something else he's famous for. One of the beasts, if you will, or monsters of Circe was the Minotaur. The Minotaur, who is the... Uh, uh, the head and tail of a bull, the body of a man. As you remember, she was the offspring of Pasiphae and Mino, and the bull, the wife of uh, Minos, who cheated on her husband with the bull. This is the one that bit off some of the fingers of Circe and later was uh, able to be defeated by Aradne and uh, uh, Theseus, who was able to get in there and find a way to kill him. And that's a whole story. That's the whole story about the labyrinth and that. If you read Circe, you know exactly what we're talking about. And this birth was 
probably one of the climactic scenes of the entire book. And finally here we have Scylla, sometimes pronounced Scylla. This was a very, very beautiful uh, nymph. And if you'll remember, as Glaucus uh, fell in love with her, sure as they couldn't stand it, poisoned, if you will, the water, turned her into this hideous creature who was out there uh, with the six heads and the 12 legs and would eat the people as the crew came by. And then later on was, as you know, in the book, defeated. And I don't want to ruin it for you if you haven't finished the book yet. We have some random pictures to show you. And the next one will be Odysseus again. This is when Odysseus got home. And Odysseus, when he got home, found out that some people, some guys, had been trying to woo his wife while he was gone. He was livid and decided, I'm going to get my wife back and slew all of them. And the, the stories involved both in uh, Circe and at the end of the uh, Odyssey, all about how he met his uh, nanny, if you will, the dog, the battle here, his son Telemachus, and things of that nature. To draw his bow back was a stunt in and of itself, but he did kill all the suitors, and we'll go from there. Next, we have Polythemus. That's the famous Cyclops from the Odyssey. And if you remember the story, it's mentioned in Circe, where Odysseus took his people, and you can see in the picture underneath each sheep is tied one of his sailors. That's how they were able to escape. He blinded the Cyclops, and the Cyclops felt the tops of the sheep, let them out to graze, not knowing that tied underneath each one was one of the uh, sailors, and that's how they escaped from the cave. Another one of Odysseus's very, very good plans that worked very well. We next have the sirens, and the sirens were the bird-like creatures who were known for their beautiful songs. They would come to ships and they would get the people to crash into the rocks by listening to the songs. No human being could stand the song. It would drive them crazy. Odysseus asked to be tied to the mast of the ship. They did so. The rest of the crew put wax in their ears. He was able to listen to the songs, did not go crazy, but also did not get destroyed by them. We also have on the next one, a more generic picture. This is another picture of the anthropomorphism. This is almost like a cartoon type character, if you will. Notice the beauty of the character. Notice the light around the character. Notice the weaponry of the character. Notice the armor of the character. The anthropomorphism, this is someone you would want to be. This is the type of a, of a human being you'd want to grow up to be. You'd want your son to grow up to be, your daughter to be one of the goddesses of that type of thing. In the next one, we have another picture of from the war. This is from the time period of the war, showing some of the outfits that they wore, the armor, and things of that nature. And finally, at the very end here, we have Hermes, the messenger. The reason I wanted to put him in at the very end of this was he had such an important role in Circe as far as bringing messages there, having a dalliance with her, and things of that nature. I thought he deserved a special mention there. Basically, that's the information for Mythology 101. I cannot see a clock right now. But We're I'm at 11-12, Dave. Yeah, I'm beyond we my time, so I think I'll end it right there. And I really, really appreciate you listening to me for all this time. Hopefully we've shown some light on what the Greeks believed, why they believed in things of that nature. I'll be happy to answer any questions if there are any. Yes, so we have a question here in the chat. What is considered source material for mythology? And are there any conflicts in that source material or between sources? Okay, there's a lot of them. Uh, the number one source of mythology is Edith Hamilton's mythology. If you want to know the stories that were gleaned from the Greeks, 
read her book. It's called Edith Hamilton's Mythology. There's another writer named Bullfinch. I can't think of his first name. He also does the stories from mythology. If, if you take the time to research each of the gods, each of the gods or goddesses had their own cult worshipers who would have feasts dedicated to them, who would have different celebrations, who would have shrines built and things of that nature. Are there conflicting stories? Absolutely there are. Uh, some of them picture them one way, some picture another. They all have different versions of the same stories. But basically what I try to give you today are the ones that are the most universally held. Now, if you do some research, for example, if you look up Apollo, you can find other stories that deal with Apollo, like the shrines that were built to him and things of that nature, which play a big role in other literature. There's, there's a lot of dramas that came out as, as Sophocles, Euripides, and some of those people wrote their plays. There's one called uh, a, when, when Agamemnon goes back home because of what he did to get the war started, he's killed by his wife. So all these different stories are celebrated in plays, in poetry, in epic poetry, and in some of the writings of some of the famous people who researched all this time. Long answer, short question. Thank you, Dave. Are there any other questions? You can send them in the chat here. Perhaps raise your hand and we can call on you. Ginger says in the chat, such a fun and fascinating info. She has to go look up the historical overlay of all the great civilizations and their mythologies. It makes sense that each would come up with their own explanations of how and why the world is the way that it is. She also says hello from the Madison class of 1976. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Ginger. <laughs> all right. Any other questions? You can always feel free also after the program to email those to me at S-L-T-O-O-L-E at maslinmuseum.org and I can get those to Dave and get you an answer. So feel free to do that. Otherwise, so thank well, you so you much to Dave Harding then and to Brandon for being our tech wizard. And again, this program is a program of the National Endowment for the Arts in partnership with Arts Midwest. And if you would like to learn more about the Big Read or join any of the other programs running through May 2nd, you can find out more information at maslinmuseum.org slash bigread. We hope that you have a great rest of your day. Thank, Thank you for everybody. joining us.